Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you out there. What a beautiful day the Lord has given us. You glad to be here? I am. I want to begin our service this morning by taking a long view of God's total history. And it all begins when God created. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into him the breath of life. Now the Lord God planted a garden, and there he put the man he had formed in that garden. And then, oh, that's right, I'm in charge today. <laughs> okay, we're going to get there, folks. Ah, yeah, and then it says, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Never forget when God created, he created us to be with him. But then sin entered and they hid from the Lord God. And the rest of the Bible is about the Lord calling us back to himself. Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. When you come to the very end of the Bible, it says this, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. You know what heaven's going to be someday? It's going to be one continuous dwelling with God in a garden beyond our imagination. So as you gather with me today, I hope you've come wanting to at least get a tad of that experience of what God wants for us to dwell with him and enjoy his company. And my prayer today is, you're not hiding from God. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord today. How good it is to be where God dwells within the hearts of his people. Lord, you don't dwell in a building made with hands. You build, you dwell in a heart that's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And today as we gather in this place, may we feel your presence. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. May we hear the words of Jesus. May we draw unto you because we are weary and burdened, but we know that we have rest in the Lord. Now today as we worship and we lift up your name, may all we say and do be to the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray and we praise. Amen. Amen. Join me as we sing together. Praise him, praise him.
hello, we have the response we're reading. But the strange thing is, the biblical reference isn't on the sheet or on the um, monitor. So we'll just go with it. <laughs> so I'll read the first part and my wife Cheryl, she would do the responsive part with everybody else. Here's the first one. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Praise the Lord, O my soul. My mouth is filled with the praise and glory all day long. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. His greatness no one can comprehend. Our one generation will announce your works to another and will tell of your mighty acts. After your son had provided cleansing for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Our Savior is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his Father without fault and with great joy. To the only God and Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, now and forevermore. Jesus will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord. To the Lord belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. God, God be praised. Be praised. quiet this morning are you awake all right well good to see you this morning and if you're here today and this happens to be your first time welcome and uh, I hope that as you worship with us today you will you'll just experience the Lord's presence and and this worship will bless you 
If you are here for the very first time, we certainly appreciate it if you wouldn't mind just signing that little uh, black thing that comes up and down the aisle or a little yellow thing in there. We'd love to send you a little something in the mail in a personal way, greet you and send you a little more information about us. Don't worry, we won't show up on your doorstep and we won't bug you, but we just want you to know we notice you're here and we're glad you're here. Well, I want to highlight a few things. How many of you driving in today saw the new lettering up on the church? All right, how many of you didn't? <laughs> well, when you go out there, we finally got it up there. And I want to thank so much Jim Bartol, because I know Jim, Jim really worked on this. And, you know, it was all God's timing, because we've been wanting to get that up for a long time. And if we'd gotten it up there a year ago, I'm not sure what we'd done because it would have said Lincoln Hills Community Church, but we, we changed that because we want people to know that we're not just for the, across the street, so we changed it to Lincoln Community Church. And if it had been Lincoln Hills, we would have had to probably have them come out and put a big slash through the hills. You know? <laughs> that would not have looked very good. But if you haven't seen it, take a look, and uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, it took us a while to get it there, but we got it. Well, tonight we have a movie night and a hot dog night. So if you just want to come for the movie, come for the movie. If you just want to come for the hot dog, you can do that too. Um, but anyway, we have a great time when we have these movie nights and uh, there'll be hot dogs. It's a $5 charge, but we'll give you an ice cream too. You know, you get a haagen ice cream. You can't beat that. It's a fun time. Now look, the movie's at 5.30. I know I tell you to come at 5, we'll serve then. I know you guys are knocking on the door at 4.30. So, you know, we'll, we'll be there for you. Um, it's going to be a fun time. The, the, the movie tonight's All Saints, and uh, John Corbett, maybe you recognize him and some things he's been in, but it, it's about a guy that leaves Wall Street and becomes a pastor, and his first, his first task is to go to this church. His, his uh, bishop wants him to sell the church and because it's just an old country church they didn't pay the bills so they want to sell the property in the process they start having uh, a number of immigrants from burma come christians and it's what god does in his heart and in that community it really is very touching i think it'll be a great thrill to your faith i think so come on tonight we're going to have a great time um Believer's baptism class, if you look at it, we had originally scheduled for the 14th. We're changing it to the 21st. Now, I'll tell you why we're doing that. Because the Ukrainian church, they, are, they were so thrilled with what our ladies did. They want me and some of our ladies to come over and officially make a presentation in the church. You know, over $4,000 was raised to help them with the refugees. So I'm gonna, after church next week, I'll be going over there. They, they worship longer than we do. They go from uh, 10 to 12, and, and, and I, they do have food, <laughs> but I think that's afterwards. So anyway, we'll get over there about 11.30, and uh, Pastor Vasily and I have just really gotten along well, and we'll, we'll be doing some other things, I'm sure, with them, and, and everybody wants to have their ladies come back and sing for us. So thank you for your generosity and but the class will be on the 21st. So if you're thinking about baptism and you're just not sure what it's all about and you'd really like to learn a little bit, um, you come to the class. We hope, I'll hope that'll make a difference for you. If you come to the class, it doesn't mean you have to get wet. But if you want to be baptized, you will get wet. Okay, we would love to just uh, help you with that, however God's leading in your life. And uh, that again on the 21st. This morning, as we pray together, there's a whole list of folks. I want to tell you, Gwen Cox is doing well. You know, lots of you know she had a fall at the ladies' thing, but she's doing well. Nothing was broken, but she's got some bumps and bruises, and it'll be a little bit before she gets back. Mike, her husband, is here, and he says she's, she's doing pretty good. So I want you to keep praying for her. Uh, Bill Scott, please be praying for Bill. Bill is under hospice care right now, and uh, just, just pray for him. Jim Bond, there he is. Stand up back there, Jim. Man alive. God bless you, my brother. He, uh, he sup Amen, amen. You know, Jim had a stroke, you know, several weeks back. 
And just a miracle how he's recovered. God has answered prayer. Um, is David Yoder here this morning? I don't think David is. I want to just share with you. I want you to pray for David. He talked to me yesterday and to Jody. Um, it's getting harder for David. David lives clear over there by Sierra College. And it's getting harder to be able to drive over. He's been part of our music for a long time. But it's just becoming, you know, actually a little dangerous for him to drive and to get all the way over here. So he's going to be going to one of our sister churches, which is only about a quarter to a half a mile from his house. And he just wanted you all to know how much this church has meant to him. He was very affirming to me and Jody. Um, but I want you to remember him in prayer. You, many of you know that his wife, Ruth, passed away several weeks back now uh, after a long siege with uh, Alzheimer's. And uh, David just been a precious guy here. But uh, it, 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 like I said, it's getting too hard and even a little dangerous to drive that far. So he's going to keep going to church. One of our sister churches there, uh, Life, Lifehouse, if you ever see it on Sierra College, that's where he's going to be going. So please pray for David. And uh, as we pray this morning, join me now. And uh, in a little, as I close, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Lord, thank you for this this place. <clears throat> Thank you that it, it is a bit of a taste of heaven. It, it doesn't compare to what it's going to be like, but Lord, we're, we're getting a taste of it, and you're, you're preparing us for the joy and, and just the praise that will happen there. Lord, today as we gather in this place, we, we lift up those who are in our midst who are struggling with illnesses, uh, with injuries, with losses. Uh, Lord, I particularly pray for Gwen Cox today that you would help her to continue to recover from falling. Thank you that nothing was broken, but in this moment today, somehow let her know that we are lifting her up. Thank you, Lord, for the answered prayer with Jim Bond. Just in you know, a living testimony to the power of prayer today as he's with us. Thank you. And Lord, we pray for Bill Scott. We know he's not well and under hospice care now. We just pray, Father, that you would be with him and, and, and with his wife, Elaine, and uh, give him the comfort of your presence. Lord, today, I want to lift up David Yoder and thank you for the years of service that he's given to us in this place. And as now he needs to stay a bit closer to home and not drive that much. We pray that you can lead him into fellowship with a new church. Comfort him, Lord, because you know he misses his wife and what it is, Lord, to lose the one you love. Lord, be his strength and be his companion. Thank you, Father, for all the good things you have done for us here in this church. And today, as we pray, we lift up the name of Jesus. And we pray as you taught us to pray, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
He gives us strength when we can't go on. He gives us shelter in the storms of life. When there's no peace on earth, there is peace in Christ. there is peace in Christ. Amen? Amen? If you've ever heard me preach, you know that I always preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the old-fashioned gospel message, and, and people think we need to bring back the old-fashioned gospel message. Can I tell you, there's no need in bringing it back because it's never really gone away. Amen? Amen? The gospel of Jesus Christ is simply this. God created us, God loved us, and we walked away from Jesus Christ through our sin. And James 4.17 tells us what sin is. If you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, that's sin. Isaiah tells us that our sins separate us from God, and yet, here's the paradox of Jesus Christ. He loves us anyway. God sent his son to die on the cross, and I don't know how he did it, but Jesus died not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And he's placed the sins on the cross of Christ. And when we believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, and according to Acts 13, 30, God raised him from the dead. Well, then we call on the name of the Lord Jesus, and we will be saved. Amen? 2 Corinthians 6.2, today is the day of salvation. And if you've never called Jesus Lord, today is the day of salvation. Amen? You find me, you find Pastor Mike, you find one of the elders, and today will be the day of salvation. Now let's get to some preaching, okay? <laughs> Good. Um, I'm going to recall one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. It's the story of the uh, discussion between the serpent and Eve. We will be in chapter 3 of Genesis. Now the serpent was craftier than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree 
in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, nor touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the, serp when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that it was desirable to make one wise, she took from the fruit and she ate, and she gave also to her husband, and he ate. You know, we talked about knowing the right thing to do and not doing it. And here in Genesis 3, we have the first recording of the first sin in the Bible. And sometimes I think when we read the Bible, we have a tendency to think that everything is happening in a very quick succession. Like we're watching a TV show. There's an introduction, there's the problem, and the conclusion. We like fast solutions to our problems, don't we? But I'm not sure that that's the way it happens in the real world. The process of change in the real world is slow. It's methodical. And many times the problems and the resulting uh, solutions, well, they take months, sometimes even years, to come up with a conclusion. A number of years ago, the Eagles came out with a brand new album. The name of their album was The Long Road Out of Eden. I thought that was kind of a cool title. I thought about that, and I said maybe that uh, when God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, they had to travel a long, long long road to get out of Eden. But reading the scripture, I've become to think of it maybe the distance that long, long road out of Eden wasn't in distance. Maybe it was in time. You see, I would like us today to look at the exchange between Adam or between Eve and the serpent, not in a discussion that happened in two minutes, but maybe a discussion that, that could have taken days, maybe weeks, maybe even longer than that. And you might think and be thinking that that boy behind the pulpit has lost his mind. My thought is this. Maybe, just maybe, if we didn't have this preconceived idea that everything went so quickly, maybe we might understand the process of the enemy. And the precedent that I'm using comes from my childhood. Remember in the 1960s, there was an innocence to American TV? Everybody remembers Ed Sullivan and the puppet Topo Gigio. I remember watching that, and Ed would talk to the mouse. The mouse would be smart alecky and talk to them, and it made us laugh. And then Ed would tuck Topo Gigio in bed and pull up the covers, give him a kiss, and turn out the lights. God, it was wonderful for children. It was wonderful for adults. You see, there was an innocence to the TV in America in the 1960s. But look at TV today. You got half-naked men and women using every four-letter word in the book, and that's only on the commercials. America did not make this change in a matter of minutes or days. This change literally, it literally took decades. And so why would we think that the fall of mankind would happen in as much time as it takes to get a 7-Up out of the refrigerator? And I'm not saying the conversation didn't take place. I believe with all my heart that it did. But if it took 60 years to change American TV, maybe it took a little bit longer than a minute for the devil to talk Eve into disobeying God's direct command and committing the first sin. And maybe, just maybe, Satan is working the same way today. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and call us your children. We thank you, Lord, that it's not a mistake that you filled your sanctuary with your children today. We pray, Lord, that you would give us an open mind and an open heart to hear your words. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move every person here to service with your spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Now the serpent was craftier than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The first thing out of Satan's mouth was in a question form. You know, and I think today men and women don't always think about the question. We spend so much more time thinking about giving somebody a good answer. We waste all the time forgetting about the question. And we spend so much time on the answer. And therein lies the danger. Eve is now thinking about an answer. She spent more time on her answer than she did thinking about the question. You see, her focus is somewhere other than doing what she knew to be right. You see, it's in the craftiness of the serpent that he knows he has time on his side. And so what does he do? He distracts Eve with a question. Could it be that the serpent planted a seed of doubt and then took a step back? and let her stew on that for a while. Maybe he let her think about it for a few days, a week, maybe a month. You see, because Adam and Eve had already been eating from the trees of the fruit of the garden, and the question from the serpent is, has God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden? When I have stopped looking at God, I start thinking about other things. And those are the times that I have to worry about. When I'm not focused on God, it steals my joy. It takes away my peace. When I'm focused on answering a worldly question, I have no peace. My peace is in Christ. Amen? Amen. So what questions are there in today's society that we've been asking ourselves recently. You see, I don't think it's the questions we need to be worried about. We need to be worried about the time we spend on the answers. What if Eve would have drawn a line in the sand and said, I know what I believe. Don't question me about the sovereignty of my God. What would happen if we ourselves, when we start to answer the world's question, what if we were to draw a line in the sand and say, I know where my faith is this far and no farther. What would happen if we didn't have to think about the questions of the world? You see, we think we can be worried about the answers, but my brothers and sisters, God already has the answers. Amen? Amen? Amen. And yet we're so busy answering all the questions of this world, we take our eyes off of God and... Uh, Satan has a number of another victory. And if you ask me, he's had far too many victories recently. We think we have to be worried about the answers. Man, we don't need to because God already has the answers. We need to be more worried about the answers because the answers will take us away from God, just like it did with Eve. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. And the serpent said, you surely shall not die. Now it could be from my point of view this morning that Eve had pondered this question for some time. And the serpent found her alone again. And so she had an answer that she would thought would put his question to rest. But what the serpent has accomplished is now that Eve is committed to the conversation. And when Eve had her answer, we need to notice that the Satan's not asking, the serpent's not asking any more questions because he never cared about the answer in the first place. You see, the serpent's goal was to get Eve's focus off of God. 
on to other things rather than following God's commandment. And so again I have to ask, what questions are there in our lives that take our eyes off of God? Are we so busy answering the questions of this world, the world's situation, po po political issues, the price of gas? Are we so many, are there so many things in this world that we think we have to come up with the answers? And maybe, maybe we have to stop asking those questions and spending time answering those questions of this world. Are we concerned about what somebody said? Are we concerned about what we thought somebody thought? Are we so concerned about what we think someone might have said? You see, when we get busy with the things of this world, we're not busy with the things of God. We don't make time for God. And the serpent gets us focused on anything else, and again, he wins the battle for our thoughts. And so Eve's answer is this, from the fruit of the tree which is in the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it nor touch it, lest you die. And the serpent goes into direct denial of what God had really said. He said, you surely shall not die. Do we see if the serpent would have started with direct denial of what God has said, Eve wouldn't even be talking to him. But the serpent knows that it's easier for us to take baby steps toward the cliff than to take one giant step off the edge. And again, again, because it's true for me, what questions are we busy answering that the enemy couldn't care less about? Are we discussing things that take our eyes off of God? Because I know we are. Shame on me. If we are involved mentally and emotionally with answering the world's questions, we are not involved with God. And that's another victory for him. Genesis 3, 5, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, we know there's only two personalities in this conversation, the serpent and Eve. The serpent is careful not to invite anyone else. He waited till Eve was alone. Both parties exclude God. Both parties exclude Adam. Do we understand that if Eve would have invited anybody else to the conversation, the turnout, the outcome might have been very different for us together? See, the serpent was crafty not to invite Adam. And Eve was foolish not to invite God. And that reminds me of somebody. It reminds me of me. And I think to myself, how many victories have I had when I fought the battle by myself? Precious few. Jesus sent his disciples out by two. Ecclesiastes tells us that two is good, but three is better. Who have we invited to come alongside of us when we think we have to answer the world's questions? And so in verse 5, Eve had time to think about what the serpent had said about God, that God's word was not true. Now in verse 6, the serpent finds Eve alone again, and he tells her a little bit more about the forbidden fruit, and she thinks, what? What? We will be like God? It is true for me, it might be true for you, that when I've thought about a lie long enough, pretty soon I start to believe the lie. And when I start to believe the lie, I look down at my feet and I see there's no line in the sand. And even though we believe in God and we trust Jesus Christ, if there's no line in the sand, who will know? Who will care if we cross over a line that's not there? Maybe if Eve would have drawn a line in the sand to begin with, this far and no farther, her life, Adam's life, our lives would have been different. My friends, what would, it be, what would our lives be like tomorrow if today we drew a line in the sand and we said to the serpent, this far 
and no farther. I'm done answering the questions of the world. Can you imagine all the pressure that's lifted up off of our shoulders? When we think we don't have to answer it, when we trust God to take care of the world situation, what would it be like? Well, I can tell you from personal experience, we would have peace in our heart and our joy would runneth over. Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eye, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and she ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. I do not think that Eve was a stupid woman. Eve may have been very smart indeed. I don't think that she would do anything rash or spontaneous. Maybe she was very deliberate and cautious. cautious. And that's why that long road out of Eden was in a time, not distance. You see, she had been thinking about her answer for a long, long time. And I wouldn't doubt that she would go out of her way just to look at that tree and, and think about what he had said and, and going to come up with an answer. It was desirable to make one wise. That is a long process. She saw the tree was good for food. She saw that it was a delight to eyes, that it was desirable to make one wise. She fought a battle by herself. She forgot about God. She saw, she desired, and she delighted. And that's when she took the fruit and ate it and then gave it to her husband. Notice, too, that Eve did not invite her husband, Adam, to be part of the battle. But here, she invites him to be part of the rebellion. Because the decisions we make often have disastrous consequences for our family. And then notice that in this part of the story, the devil has left them alone. He's not involved with the story anymore. He denied God's word. He tempted Eve. Eve fell. Adam fell. Mankind has fallen. And it all started with a question Eve thought she had to answer. So what's the preacher saying today? Preacher, what do you want me to know when I leave this sanctuary? Two things. When we look at the difficulties and the trials and the tribulation in this world, be assured, be assured that the serpent is going to ask you a question. How are we going to fix this? Because as soon as he gets our eyes focused on that, our eyes aren't, are not on God anymore. And when the serpent asks us the question, we cannot be like Eve and exclude God from the conversation. John 16, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you might have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. When the world threatens to take your eyes off of God, I need to get close to Jesus. I need to keep my eyes on Jesus. Amen? God be praised. Let's join the Lord's table. Now I am. This is my day for not pushing the right buttons. But Jody pushed the right button today. Because I think as we come to this table, I think of the question that Jesus asked. Not the question that Satan asked, but the question that Jesus asked. And he said to his disciples, Who do men say that I am? Remember that? And... Uh, 
They had to think about the answers. They gave several answers. Oh, some say you're, you're John the Baptist. Come back. Others think you're a prophet. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And that is the all-important question that each of us have to answer. And Peter said it, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, it was further down the road when they came to that upper room that night, night before Jesus was crucified. And there in that upper room, they're still kind of thinking about that answer. Because the scriptures, the gospel writers tell us that they were all kind of arguing among themselves. Who's going to be number one? Who's going to get to sit closest to Jesus when he comes in his kingdom? Then he gave them the answer they needed to hear. They didn't even understand it yet. But that night in that upper room, it tells us that he took a towel and he girded himself and he washed their feet. He said, I've given you an example. Part of my answer is, now you do this too. And then he took what they assumed was the Passover meal. So last Passover meal, really, that would ever be offered, at least by God. And he took that meal, and in that moment, and this is what he said. He took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Here's part of the answer. This is my body. It'll be broken for you. And then he said, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant. It's a new agreement with God in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And there was the answer. The answer, who am I am? Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Now he's dramatically portraying it for them. I will be the offering for your sin. They still didn't really get it. Because that night on the way out, scriptures tell us they're looking back at this magnificent city of Jerusalem and they pointed to Jesus and said, isn't it wonderful? And Jesus told them, don't put all your eggs in that basket because it's going to be destroyed. Then they get out in the garden, and Jesus prays, but they, they're falling asleep. And then those who come to arrest him, Peter pulls out a knife, cuts off the ear of one of the guys. And Jesus said, you still don't get it. Put that away. Don't you know that right now I could call 12 legions of angels. I don't need your help. And then he goes. They still didn't get it. And they're hunkered down in, a, in an upper room that says, for fear of the Jews. But they began to get it the day of that resurrection. When Jesus walked into, I, Jesus, I think, passed right through the walls. He was suddenly there. He says, peace, peace. You know what this table's about today? It's about his peace for your life my life. Who do men say that you are? Well, they say a lot of things, but we say he is the prince of peace. Who is our peace? Because there on the cross he died for our sins. And ever since that moment in time, believers down through the centuries have been partaking of what we call the Lord's Supper or Communion or the Eucharist, a lot of different names, but it's all about believers remembering the real answer. He is the body, he is the blood given for us. And we do this in remembrance of the greatest answer of all. This morning, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he invites you to his table. You don't have to be a member of this church. You have to be a member of God's church, his community of faith. And he invites you to come to this table today.
Lord, as we take this bread and this cup, we ask you now to bless it to our hearts. As we take of it, may we know the only answer that is the right answer, that you indeed are the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through you. Thank you for dying for our sins and rising to give us the promise of eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now if you'll peel off that little cellophane on the top and you can take of the bread. And Jesus said to us, all of you, take eat, this is my body given for you. And then if you can peel that foil back. And Jesus said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Now if you'll pass those to the right, our folks will come and and uh, collect those from you. And while they're doing that, I want to introduce to you some new family members here. Folks that have come through our uh, welcome class and have shared their testimony and have uh, given them testimony of their faith in Jesus Christ, and so I want, it's a joy today to introduce to you eight people, and I want to ask each of these folks if they will come and join us up front. Uh, Kurt Fritz and uh, Jan Sweetland. Kurt and Fre uh, Jan here today? Good. Kurt, God bless you. Good to have you, Jan. Come on, just join us right up here, and and then Patricia Singh. Patricia, are you here? I know you're here. I saw you. There you are. <laughs> Patricia just moved into the area. She's come here on and off whenever she's visited her family, but she's up here now, and good to have you here. All the way from down in Visalia. Great. Then um, Sharon McMillan. Is Sharon here? There she is. Sharon's been helping us in the office in the last... Uh, couple months and it's just been a big help to us. It's so good to have you here, Sharon. God bless you. Great to have you. And then let me introduce to you Bob and Lucille Putnam. Bob and Lucille. I know they're here. There they are. I got to tell you something about Bob. This is very interesting. First of all, let me shake your hands. Lucille, God bless you. And Bob, I was reading a book, <laughs> one of many, recently by uh, Donna McCullough, great writer of history uh, about the pioneers. And it was about, about shortly after the Revolutionary War about those who came and settled the Ohio River Valley. It's quite a history. And one of the key people was a general in George Washington's army, a General Putnam. Well, the day that I met this couple, Bob tells me, well, my great-great-great-great-grandfather was a general in George Washington's army. <laughs> I think I just read about that. <laughs> oh, God bless you. So good to have you both here. And then Jean and Mary Lou Bell. Jean and Mary Lou, there you are. And Jean, I know, played taps for us at uh, Memorial Day. God bless you both. It's so good to have you here, Mary Lou. And... Uh, if you're as delighted as I am to have these folks here, say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right. Good to have you here. Why don't you all come in a little closer? Margaret has always got her camera there. Let's get us in, all in here. Can you get us in here? Yes. Okay. We'll smile. <laughs> One, two, three. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, we're going to close our service. And uh, I don't know, what, what song are we singing here this morning? All right. 
Jesus, we just want to thank you. And we want to thank you, Lord, for these folks here. And when we close our service in a few moments, I'd like to just invite you to come down. And you guys have to stay here. And just shake their hands and just walk them. It's so great to have you all here, part of our family. Well, let's sing together. Ladies, you're going to lead us? All right. Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we have gathered here today to praise your name. We ask you to bless us as we end our service. As we have partaken in the Lord's Supper today, we want wait on your return, O Christ. What a blessed day that will be. Son of God, before we part our separate ways, we ask you to guide us as we go home. May you protect us from any harm on the way, and may we live in peace and harmony in your name. Amen.